Hello, squad, and welcome to this week's episode of Crime Squad Podcast. I'm your host, Natasha, and I've got a little bit of a different show in store today. This episode is going to dive into the mind of psychopaths. If you're part of the squad and listening to this podcast, I'm going to bet you have some knowledge of serial killers. And for some of you who happen to be psychology buffs, you may have the knowledge that most often serial killers are diagnosed with various psychological disorders, but most often one called antisocial personality disorder, or APD for short. But did you know psychologists believe there are psychopaths among us living relatively normal lives? They refer to these people as successful psychopaths. Think CEOs of major corporations. Think investors who work with high-risk investments. So if there are more psychopaths than we could ever imagine living among us, then it stands to reason not all psychopaths are killers. We hear so often about those who kill, but what about those who don't? This begs the question, are psychopaths born with a predisposition for murder? Or can they exist among us living what appears to be a normal life? I have a riddle for you. Ready? Here we go. It's late at night. You live in an apartment and you hear a woman screaming outside. You go to your window and look out where you see a man attacking a woman. The man somehow feels your eyes on him and he looks in your direction. You know he's seen you watching. You know this because he gestures to you. What gesture does he make? Okay, I'm so curious to know what most of you think the answer is. I should say this is by no means a diagnostic tool, but more of an interesting and thought-provoking riddle. I've asked this of many of my friends and family, and many of them answered with, he gives you the middle finger, or he holds his hand up to his mouth to shush you or zip your lip, and even he motions slitting his throat as if to say, you're next. However... If you answered, he's counting the floors, you may be a psychopath. In theory, if he was counting the floors, he's doing that to find out exactly what floor you're on so he can kill you too. No witnesses. Still not convinced? Think of the first scary movie you watched, one that truly scared you. If you can't name one, you may be a psychopath. Think of a time you experienced embarrassment or anxiety about taking a risk. If you can't think of a time, you may be a psychopath. Does it mean you're going to go out and commit heinous crimes? Not necessarily. Does it mean you may be capable of committing a heinous crime? Maybe. Are you questioning things yet? I think we've all known someone that's made us feel uneasy. I would say there's varying degrees of uneasiness, though, to be fair. The guy who stares at you during the bus ride you're taking to work on a Saturday can make your skin crawl or make you uncomfortable, sure. I think it's very possible, though, that a great number of people have actually experienced some sort of a relationship with a person who behaves in a way that makes you go, hmm. This could be a boss, a parental figure, a spouse, an acquaintance. It could be just about anybody. The thing about psychopaths is that they often try to blend in by mimicking behaviors they witness in people. I assume they realize early on they're different than most people and know enough to try to emulate varying emotion-based responses. But every so often, a psychopath will reveal their true nature. If you think you may know someone who fits the mold, or let's face it, if you're sitting here thinking, holy shit, I might be a psychopath, here's a sample list of questions to ask yourself. It's from the website www.psychopathfree.com. So number one, does the person keep promises they made to you or do they never follow through and can't keep up with their keep up with their grand sweeping statements? Does the person seem to be understanding of feelings or emotions and display empathy accordingly or do they tend to be more self-centered and uncaring? 
Three, does the person tend to be hypocritical, such as having extremely high expectations of you or other people, but the same standards do not appear to apply to them? Four, do they lie? Are they never at fault for anything and quick to provide excuses, even for minor things that don't require excusing? Five, is there a dramatic element to the relationship? For instance, did the person indicate they dislike drama and yet there seems to be a ton of it in your regular interactions? Do you often argue about the same things and feel as though they're creating drama than judging you for your reactions? Six, how do they handle being bored? Do they constantly need to have attention or some source of entertainment from others? If any of these sound familiar, you may have crossed paths with a, with a psychopath. If this applies to someone you know, I would recommend really looking at the relationship you have objectively. Is it worth it to stay in something you know is toxic? Okay, okay. So let me just be clear here. I'm not a licensed psychologist, nor am I a relationship counselor. But I am someone who's seen my fair share of these personality types, both intimately and not intimately. Combined with the research I've done, um, I really don't see any harm in saying the following. If you think something is off, think objectively. Educate yourself. Sometimes you don't know how bad it is until you break ties and then you can see the person for who they really are. I've been drawn to narcissists and sadists my entire life and the only through education and let's be honest, quite a few years of professional counseling was I able to identify these people and what existed inside me that caused me to seek them out. And that seems like a great place to do another riddle. All right, squad, here we go. A woman's mother dies. At the funeral, she meets a man she's never seen before, and they head it off. She knows she has feelings for the man, but she forgets to get his contact information. She desperately tries to find out who he is without success. A week later, she kills her sister. Why? Stay tuned to this episode to find out the answer. Back to the conversation about psychopaths, though. I'm going to give you some examples and some psychological information. Okay, so I know I typically cover Canadian cases. However, um, I'm going to I'm going to talk today about Leonard Lake and Charles Ng. So let's get into that. Leonard Lake and Charles Ng were a pair of sadistic serial killers who were active in the early 1980s in the U.S. By some bizarre fate, they met through a personal ad Lake had published in a survival magazine, and they began a spree of killing mostly families. Their victims were Harvey and Deborah Dubbs, a husband and wife, and Sean, their infant son. Lonnie and Brenda O'Connor and Lonnie Bond Jr., their infant son. Clifford Paranto, Jeffrey Gerald, Michael Carroll, Kathleen Allen, and Scott Stapley. Reading the names out loud really drives home how many victims lost their lives to Ng and Lake. Backing up for a second to 1971, when Lake was actually diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder and was in therapy for some time to help treat the disorder. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, indicates that in order to diagnose a person with schizoid personality disorder, they must show at least four of the following symptoms and that these must be present in a variety of situations starting in early adulthood. So does not want or enjoy having relationships, including being part of a family, prefers their own company, including not seeking sexual relationships, rarely participates in activities or has hobbies, lacks close friends other than first degree relatives, doesn't really care what people think of them, good or bad, is emotionally distant or cold. So again, I'm no professional, but to me, a lot of those symptoms, based on what we know about Lake, seem false. And I say this because he seemed to develop a close relationship with Charles Ng, even though it was some kind of sadistic bond. He was also a violent and sadistic rapist, which doesn't scream of a lack of pleasure in activities or a little interest in sexual experiences. As I suggested earlier in this episode, many serial killers are actually diagnosed with something called antisocial personality disorder. So if we take a look at the symptoms of antisocial personality disorder, according to the DSM, these symptoms are abuse of others, whether physical, sexual, or emotional, lack of stability in job and home life, aggressive and irritable, lack of remorse, 
irresponsible, can be reckless and impulsive, untrustworthy, lies a lot, usually presents if there's a childhood diagnosis of a conduct disorder. Based on the different symptoms, it seems Lake was misdiagnosed and was actually suffering from antisocial personality disorder. Now, we could speculate forever on what was truly wrong with Leonard Lake, but we'll never really know because on June 2nd, 1985, Lake was arrested in San Francisco after police conducted a vehicle search and found an illegal 22 revolver outfitted with a silencer. While being questioned at the police station, Lake swallowed a cyanide pill that he had sewn into his shirt. He was pronounced dead four days after slipping into a coma due to the cyanide. In any case, whether it was schizoid personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder, does this mean being a murderer could be attributed to a chemical issue within our brains? Scientists and psychologists have been asking the question of what causes, causes us to be the way we are for many, many moons. You have probably heard the term nature versus nurture. For me, my morbid curiosity has always centered around all of the whys. I want to understand the history starting from a person's childhood. I believe that nurture plays an important part in the development of a psychopathic mindset, but it's definitely not the only component. The answer partially lies in science. A quick fact drop about the human brain. Scientists have mapped out sections of our brains that are shown to control specific functions. There's the amygdala, which is linked to emotional output. It's also been linked to aggression and fear reactions. And then there's the frontal lobe, and this controls speaking and muscle movements, but also includes judgment making and impulsivity. If the frontal lobe is damaged as a result of an injury, this could be used to explain a lack of remorse and empathy. Dennis Rader is a convicted murderer who claimed the lives of 10 victims. Known for binding, torturing, and killing his victims, he was said to have suffered from a major head injury as a child that caused damage to the frontal lobe of his brain. Could this be a biological reason for his despicable actions? And despite personality differences, our human brains are not unalike. We all have the same components of the brain that control our emotions, our aggression, and our judgment. I have always remembered this particular case study from a university course textbook, and it blows my mind. So it shows that people aren't necessarily born with a desire to hurt people, but this could be caused by the biological makeup of our brains. So I'm so excited to share this with you because to me, it's just such an interesting take on um, the science of our brain. So according to this case study, there was a man who lived with his wife and young stepdaughter in Virginia. He worked as a teacher, nothing odd in this, but something odd was certainly developing because quite randomly, after never having displayed any indication of pedophilia, he began to collect sex magazines, visit child sexual assault websites, and make advances toward his own stepdaughter. His wife found out and did the right thing. She called the police. He was convicted of child molestation, and although he attended a rehabilitation program for sex addiction, he still felt incredibly strong urges to the point where he would become overwhelmed. He had also been complaining of headaches and admitted he'd had thoughts of suicide. Doctors conducted a brain scan, which revealed a tumor the size of an egg located behind his right temple. And in the brain, the right temple would be mapped as the frontal lobe. And here's the thing, doctors operated and removed the tumor. And as a result, all of the abnormal sex attractions went away and the man reconciled with his family. So like, again, this is definitely an interesting take on what goes on in our brains. And further still, there is the thought that some murderers state the reason why they kill is because they were abused in childhood. Do you think rehabilitation is possible if somebody has suffered an extremely abusive childhood? And what I mean by that is, if someone suffered an extremely abusive childhood, then went on to commit horrific acts of violence, either as a child or an adult, do you think it's possible that they can be rehabilitated and released into society, or should they be imprisoned? Okay, squad, let's look at a rehabilitation case that was supposedly successful, but first, let's revisit the riddle. So again, just to refresh you, the riddle I said a little bit earlier in the episode is a woman's mother dies. 
At the funeral, she meets a man she's never seen before, and they hit it off. She knows she has feelings for the man, but she forgets to get his contact information. She desperately tries to find out who he is without success. A week later, she kills her sister. Why? So what do you think? Why does she kill her sister? Honestly, I'm such a psychology nerd. I asked this question of approximately 50 people. And there were two prominent answers provided by the majority of people. The first was that the woman found out the sister killed the mother and she killed her sister out of revenge. The second was that the woman found out her sister was sleeping with the man from the funeral and this enraged her so she killed her sister in an act of passion. The psychopath answer? The woman killed her sister because the man from her mother's funeral might show up to mourn her sister so she'd have the chance to reconnect with him and this time get his contact information. Ice cold, am I right? So far, we've talked about the psychology behind what makes a serial killer, and I posed a question. Is it possible for people who commit terrible crimes, including murder, to be rehabilitated? In the eyes of a law, the next case we're going to explore is of a child who became a murderer at the age of 11. And this is supposedly a perfect example of rehabilitation working. I'll let you be the judge. I do need to say as well, this is your trigger warning. There will be very brief mentions of violence against children, as well as a brief mention of sexual assault. But like always, I will let you know when it's coming so you can skip ahead. In May of 1957, Mary Bell was born to a mother named Betty. Her father is not known, but the rumors were it was the well-known violent criminal, Billy Bell. I need to mention as well, this case is in the United Kingdom. At a young age, Mary began to experience horrific abuse. Her mother is reported to have been a volatile alcoholic, and it was believed she had Munchausen's by proxy, which is a psychological disorder. It's when a person basically causes health issues for people in their care, usually a mother to a child. They may poison things to keep a child sick or cause them to get hurt and need medical attention. So um, skip ahead like 10 seconds. but if, you're, if you don't want to hear mention of child sexual assault, um, Betty was a sex worker and unfortunately forced Mary to participate in prostitution at a young age. This is absolutely horrifying, um, but family members of Mary and Betty knew of times where Betty would try to kill her daughter and make it look like an accident. Little Mary Bell didn't stand a chance. One can only imagine what she went through and endured just because she was born into this world. And unfortunately, Mary did not come out unscathed. Mary Bell would go on to commit terrible crimes against children. At the age of 10, on May 25th, 1968, she lured young Martin Brown, aged four, to an abandoned house. It was here that she strangled him to death. Mary even had an accomplice and a friend and neighbor, Norma Bell, which is of no relation to Mary. They just happened to have the same last name. Martin's mother reported him missing very quickly because Martin was never too far from home. Police would go looking and young Martin's body would soon be located. Mary Bell, who knew all too well what actually happened to Martin, went to the Brown home to ask if she could see him. His distraught mother told Mary he was dead and Mary did something that would turn everyone's blood cold. Mrs. Brown reported that Mary smiled widely and said, Quote, I know he's dead. I want to see him lying dead in a coffin. End quote. Two months later, on July 31st, three-year-old Brian Howe met his untimely end again at the hands of Mary Bell, who had just turned 11 years old. Norma Bell was also present during this murder. The details of what happened came out during the trial. Norma testified against Mary. She said that they both led Brian to an abandoned lot and strangled him. Norma admitted she and Mary had gone back to the scene two additional times to later look at the body. 
Norma said that on these visits, Mary had cut a lock of the boy's hair with scissors and used a razor to cut little Brian's body. Specifically, she carved the letter M into his abdomen. This is horrible, horrible stuff. I hated every minute of researching this case, and I'm not even really getting into gratuitous explanations of what they had done. Um, I was so disgusted, though, at the complete lack of emotion and the care. It's so callous. When the community found out these horrific acts were committed by a child, it was pure shock from everyone the story touched. And so, in December of 1968, Mary Bell was found guilty of, man of only manslaughter. But I wasn't able to find much detail on why that versus murder. I'm guessing because of the age. She ended up being sentenced to life in prison. Her accomplice, Norma Bell, ended up being acquitted. I mean, let's be honest, squad. It's clear Mary was the dominant one and the aggressor, um, especially from the extra research that I had done. So while Mary was serving time in prison, psychologists began to investigate why she committed these despicable acts. And they started by trying to understand her childhood. When the early life of young Mary was revealed, psychology experts believed the abuse she went through directly impacted her emotional development. This is what caused her to be so cold and calculating with a solid lack of empathy. So this sounds like Mary was truly a psychopath, and I'd even say sadism is present too. So the question remains, can criminals who have experienced trauma in childhood, whether psychological, sexual, or emotional, be re rehabilitated and released? The UK prison system seemed to think so. Believe it or not, Mary Bell served only 12 years in prison and was released at the age of 22. Not only that, but she was granted the ability to hide from the press or other prying individuals. She changed her name and moved around a lot to avoid being found. By all accounts, she has not committed another violent crime. She was, however, hunted by the tabloids over an 18-year period and was successfully traced many times by reporters. Mary Bell became a spectacle in the media in 1998 when a journalist named Gita Sereni located Mary and paid her for her story so the journalist could publish a book. And Gita Sereni did publish a book. It's called Cries Unheard. Cries Unheard, apparently, and I can't say for certain because I've never read it myself, gives an inside look as to what life was really like for Mary as a child. She explained her mother was extremely sadistic. The book did well, but Gita came under fire. The media believed it was unethical for Gita and Mary to make a profit off the details of what had happened to the victims. The family of the victims felt if there was profit to be had, the funds should be donated to charity. And I honestly don't disagree. By this time in 1998, Mary was seemingly well integrated into society. She had a partner and a 14-year-old daughter, neither of whom knew about her past. So when the media was angry about the profits that she was making off the book, she took it upon herself to file a legal order to ask that she not be able to be identified in her current life. And then by April of 2003, she filed another legal order that granted her and her teenage daughter anonymity for life. The Attorney General agreed the Human Rights Act gave Mary the right to privacy in a family life. Mary Bell is a very interesting contrast. Although she killed in cold blood, after rehabilitation in prison and being released, she lived a happy and relatively normal life. What do you think about Mary Bell? All right, so reminding back and thinking back to earlier in the episode where we talked about the different ways psychopaths can actually be present in our lives. And so if you are wondering uh, about a particular person or, you know, maybe yourself, if you're wondering if maybe you have some psychopathic tendencies, the good news is you can be tested and officially diagnosed. Author M.E. Thomas is a diagnosed psychopath. She, however, prefers to use the word sociopath. Her reasoning? Society tends to associate the word psycho with crazy. And about psychopaths, Thomas says, quote, we are your neighbors, your coworkers, and quite possibly the people closest to you, lovers, family, friends, end quote. 
Thomas says she realized something was different about her internal thoughts when she hit the age of 30. It was enough of a difference she went to a psychologist for an official diagnosis. Well, she wasn't wrong when she said she thought differently. The psychologist actually diagnosed Thomas with antisocial personality disorder. This is the very same disorder many serial killers are diagnosed with. Interestingly, Thomas goes on to say that actually 4% of the American population are considered non-criminal psychopaths. And this type tends to live relatively normal lives. In her book, Confessions of a Sociopath, we are taken on a dark journey into her narcissistic mind. For me, a self-professed empath, I found it so difficult to read. The opening chapter, for instance, begins with the author describing a time when she had a job teaching swimming lessons. So fast forward like 18 seconds if you don't want to hear about animal cruelty. On the day of one of these swimming lessons, she noticed a baby possum in the pool close to drowning. She stares at it as it thrashes and tries to cling to life with very little emotion. There is no empathy, no sadness, no desire to save the animal. She instead gets a pool skimmer and forces the animal under the water in an attempt to kill it. She knew if the animal were to die, she could cancel the next swimming lesson and have the afternoon to herself. She said, quote, in letting the baby possum die a slow and painful death, I didn't feel sad or happy about it. I took no pleasure in its suffering. I did not give it a thought. I didn't feel anything other than a desire to solve my problem in the simplest way possible, end quote. While this seems cold and disturbing to most people, to a psychopath, this is just a way of life. Their thoughts and actions center around themselves and how to get what they want or need without considering anybody else. So if the traits are the same, then what sums them apart from those who kill? That's my question. Thomas says her childhood was normal. No abuse, no maltreatment. If she had a difficult, abusive childhood, would she have turned out different? There was one incident, however, where things could have been very different for her. Thomas actually admits that one day she was told off by a metro worker for ignoring a gate he'd put up to show that an escalator was closed. Thomas decided to go up the escalator anyway, and the man didn't like this. He yelled at her. And then, she says, something inside her snapped. The adrenaline kicked in, and she started to discreetly follow the man as he walked away. She took her time so she could catch him off guard, waiting for the moment they'd wind up alone in a hallway so she could strangle him. She wanted to watch him die a slow death. Fortunately for him, she says, he got away because she'd lost sight of him. But she admits she still wonders what would have happened if that moment presented itself. She coldly assesses whether or not she would have been able to overpower him. And if she were caught, if she would be able to spin a story and make it believable enough so that she could avoid getting a guilty verdict. You'll notice there's nothing about whether or not he had a family who would miss him. In fact, there's no remorse at all. There is only concern about herself. She was mad because she was chastised. She wanted to teach him a lesson and strangle him. And she wanted to know if she could get away with it. Clearly, only concerned about herself. I would rate this book three and a half stars out of five. But for all those interested in reading it, I will let you be the judge. I think what probably surprised me most, though, was who Thomas really is outside of the anonymity she uses for the book. Would it surprise you to know Thomas, at the time of writing the book, was a 30-year-old female who teaches Sunday school and is is an accomplished lawyer and law professor? Because it surprised me, but after everything we've learned, maybe it's not so surprising. According to statistics, 1 in 25 people are psychopaths. Who do you know that might have something to hide? So that's going to do it, folks, for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll come back next week for another episode of Crime Squad. I'm your host, Natasha, reminding you, stay safe and be kind to each other.